So welcome to the Shoreline Conversations podcast. We're uh, excited to be having this conversation today. We actually just started our tactics uh, series for this podcast with Pastor Dennis, but we're going to take a quick break uh, from that and just have a little interjection here from uh, Josh Laxton. He's a guest preacher this Sunday, and we just kind of wanted to take advantage of having him here and in person. So we had a great conversation about his involvement with the Billy Graham Center and just his uh, background in ministry and uh, what it means to be on mission for the gospel, but also just taking a little more uh, slightly in-depth look of of some of the topics from his sermon on Sunday. And so uh, without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. So Josh, Josh Laxton, it's good to have you here in our our little studio. And I'm I'm excited to have this conversation with you. we just met. We did. We just did. met for the I was, very first time. I was, I was roaming around the shoreline, yeah. you know, property. Yeah. You were like, and I don't really know who I'm <laughs> looking for. I, yeah. Yeah. No, it's good to, good to have you here. Um, we're excited for uh, this Sunday coming up. We are pre-recording this uh, before you preach. Um, but uh, before we get into that, I just want to kind of ask... Like who are you? Give me give me yeah. the the scoop on on you, your life, your what you do, everything. Right. Where you're from? Yeah, well, so the more I talk, the more people will realize that <laughs> I, you know, one, I'm probably not from California. That sounds fair. And then two, I'm probably not from where I live right now. So really? we so we live uh, right outside of Chicago in Wheaton, Illinois. Wow. And so even then, we've been there for about two years. And as you know, as I meet new people, they're like, "Where are you from?" Because you're not from you here. You got to draw. And so I have. <laughs> Yeah, just that little, you know, and I always tell people, you should, you should have heard me, you know, when I was growing up, like, uh, I, I sound like Larry, the cable guy, Oh yeah, you, you know, so, um, do you like fishing too? Uh, well, <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a whole another story Not in, in and of itself. Cause I, you know, so I grew up in Tennessee, <laughs> oh, wow, uh, right cool. outside of Memphis in a, in a rural area. Yeah. And so I grew up hunting and fishing, yeah. but when it, when it, when it comes to fishing though, uh, I would always ask my dad or whoever I was fishing with right. to take the fish off the hook because I don't like to, you know, I don't like touching Slimy. fish. So, <laughs> so I, I would do all of the the redneck stuff, yeah. you know. And so, uh, but yeah, so that's that's where I'm from, you, you know, uh, Tennessee, uh, yeah. but live right outside of Chicago in Wheaton, Illinois. Very cool. Yeah. I, my my uh, best friends in the whole entire world they live uh, just outside of Nashville and Columbia. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's. It's amazing. They were actually here just a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, leading worship with us and visiting with my, my wife and I. I grew up with this kid. We met in preschool. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, but he loves being out in, in like this. It's not like rural, rural, but it's like, it's very, very small, small town, Columbia. I don't know if you know Columbia right, at I all. Do know yeah. Col- yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's not a lot, but he he plays he plays for an artist, a country artist out okay. there, and and uh, so he's going to Nashville a lot. But I love Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee. Well, great. I always tell people it depends on which part of Tennessee. Okay, that you're that's in, fair. Right? That's fair. I mean, because there's like kind of three. Well, I mean, three main parts. Right? Yeah. You have West Tennessee, mm-hmm. Central, which is kind of yeah. Nashville. Which I mean, Nashville has just I mean blossomed over the you oh, know the last decade or so. And then you have Eastern Tennessee with the mountains yeah. and it's, and it's beautiful, mm-hmm. you, you know, kind of there. But yeah, so I grew up where the cotton fields were. Oh. So, I mean, if you like cotton and that's your thing, yeah, then, then that's you would have loved it, but yeah. <laughs> it was flat, not a lot of scenery. Yeah. And so, um, and it's very, very hot in the summer. So, oh my gosh. I know yeah. it's so weird too. Cause I'm, I'm, you know, being from San Diego, not used to that either. Cause we, we've been, been out there. I, I actually, a couple of times, cause he went to school out there. Uh, and it's just gross sweltering, <laughs> like, like, or this, uh, that humid thing. But then I've gone out in there like in the winter and it's been snowing. Right. And it's like so weird for me. I'm like, I don't, I yeah. don't. Well, yeah. Well, and, and Wheaton, so where we live, I mean, oh snow is, gosh. is, uh, well, you know, we've been fortunate this year though, really? because, uh, so <laughs> last, you know, last October it snowed on Halloween. And it just kept on snowing. I mean, oh we're gosh. like, what in the world? What what have we gotten ourselves into? And uh, but so this year it's been relatively mild. Yeah. It has it's only snowed you know twice, but yeah. not a lot of accumulation. And so, yeah. but we know January and February is coming. So Ooh, I, have, I have have the snowblower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have the snowblower ready, ready, <laughs> ready to go. But I'm not really a snow person. Like really, it, so in Tennessee, it really like it, if it snowed, like it was like once, maybe twice, mm-hmm. and everything shut down. Right, and it was. It was, it was just enough where you could go sledding, just enough. Yeah. But, you know, in in Chicago, have all you want. So, Whew, 
Ooh, I don't know if I want that much, but but this, <laughs> but this, you know, the weather here we're, right now, it is so like it's like we got out, and we were driving around in Carmel this yeah. morning, and and it's like forty eight degrees. We're like, man, this is this is awesome for yeah. like this time of year. But, I know you were asking yeah. us earlier. You're like, is it cold yeah. here? Like, I mean, I probably look ridiculous wearing a jacket in the. You get your little here. fleece I know. lining, I you know. Take this off. I'm like, well, you know, yeah, I'm like. <laughs> Yeah, I'm take this off. I look ridiculous. Uh, no, uh, it's it is a weird it's a weird uh, climate here. I you know it's a and it can be a, kind of a shock to some people when they come here and it's like, you know, I went I went to Target and it was like cold and 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 kind of you know almost rainy and then like I drove you know ten minutes down the highway and it's and it's like sun out and like it's you know it's, it's kind of shocking for people but so uh tell us what do you what do you do out there in yeah. chicago okay. and, all, and all that snow other than blowing snow other than blowing snow well the reason do? why we moved out so i have been in uh, vocational ministry for about 20 years I, I got into it when i was yeah. 17 wow so actually you know a little bit over 20 years um mm-hmm. and so i was i was a lead pastor in kentucky and i knew ed stetzer he and i we yeah. had connected uh, and Ed Sitzer is kind of a voice for, you know, one of the, you know, kind of leading voices for uh, the evangelical church. Mm-hmm. So a cultural commentator, writer, yeah. author. We've had him um, here a couple times. Have yeah. You. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. Shoreline would be very familiar with Ed. Yeah. Uh, so I was connected to Ed. We kind of uh, had kind of reconnected uh, via phone. And mm-hmm. he said he was looking for an assistant director. Uh, for the Billy Graham Center. Wow. And uh, this was going to be a newly created position, and he wanted me. He's like, you know, you and I have very similar theology. You know me because you're going to be helping me lead out on initiatives and, you know, re- you know, uh, representing me. Mm-hmm. And so uh, would you pray about it? And so we prayed about it, and then, you know, one thing led to another, and yeah. God led us to uh, uh, Wheaton, Illinois, at the Wheaton College Billy Graham yeah. Center. And so we've been there for about two years with uh, working alongside with Ed Stetzer. And so I do a lot of different things. So yeah. it keeps me busy. Um, so I research, I write, um, I write uh, for Ed's uh, kind of uh, portion of Christianity today that he yeah. has uh, called The Exchange. So I get to write there some. I've gotten to write an ebook with him. Uh, wow. You know, so just a lot of different things get to, you know, get to help him you know, succeed um, and yeah. then also get to kind of do stuff for, you know, for myself on the side. Yeah, that's very so. cool. So what, so it sounds like, you know, Ed kind of reached out to you because he he knew you, you had some connections, you had uh, maybe a, a history of ministry that like he kind of fell in line with and, and saw a connection there. But like, right. what, what was that specifically that like you were doing at the time and you said in Kentucky? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. he really like pulled you in and was like, Hey, I want you to be on this team. Yeah. Well, so where we, where we connected was around 2010, 2011. Mm-hmm. I was in a PhD program, um, centering around missiology. Oh, that's and a new so, word for a lot of people probably. Yeah. So mi- missiology <laughs> is, is really the theology yeah. of the mission of God is, Very is cool. what it is. And so that's where we connected and kind of through a lot of my writings there. And then I had also done some projects with, with him in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, his theology and my theology and his, you know, thinking about mission, my thinking about mission, uh, they really are very similar yeah. and webbed together. And so because because of that and because of my passion for the mission of God and reaching people far from uh, God, he's like, man, this would be a really good fit because you would help me. You know, you this is this is your wheelhouse, you know, and then but the, the other thing that, too, was uh, part of the equation is that. I didn't want to be disconnected from the local church. Mm-hmm. Like I do still believe that there's this call in my life to be part of the local church. Yeah. And so I've been able to be a teaching pastor at the church where we Very attend cool. and uh, also uh, overseeing the young adult uh, ministry Very cool. uh, there. And so... So all you know, so they, all of that keeps me busy. But to answer right. your question, that it was really the mission, you, you know, uh, of God and kind of the theology surrounding mm-hmm. that that yeah. really you know makes Ed and I work well together. Right. right. So that's uh, when you say the mission um, and like in missions and yeah. missiology. You're, are you talking about like the Great Commission kind of thing? Like yeah. you know, not necessarily vocational, but right. like being on mission as a Christian instead of like uh, you know. I think a lot of churches have like 
like missions or global missions right. or, you know, like, so, or is that all inclusive or like, yeah, what? I mean, that, yeah, let's, let's dive a yeah, little yeah. bit deeper into that because I, you know, I think that is, I think that's very fascinating for, for people to, you know, kind of let's, let's dive deep yeah, into yeah. this idea of mission, right? Because growing up in Tennessee, yeah. uh, if someone would have asked me, uh, w- w- what would you say the mission of God is and where is it yeah. found uh, to reach lost people, you know, for Jesus and it's found in Matthew 28. Yeah. Go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, throughout my studies and um, and and really, a, a, I would say a, a climactic moment mm-hmm. for me where my mind <laughs> began to change was when I was a sophomore in college and I read this book uh, in this class called Global Christianity mm-hmm. t- entitled Unveiled at Last by Bob Shogram. And in that, he talks about how God has been on mission from Genesis to Revelation. Mm-hmm. And he pinpoints God's mission starting with Abraham in Genesis, yeah. which I had never heard. You know, yeah. right? So he'll go to Genesis 12, you know, where God calls Abraham, I want you to go to a place, uh, yeah. and I'm not going to tell you kind of where, you just, you just go, yeah. and as you go, I'll show you, uh, but I'm going to make you a great great name, a great nation, and through you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Yeah. And so really understanding for the first time that God's mission isn't necessarily, uh, I mean, yes, it's in the New Testament, but that's not where it begins. Yeah. Like one of the one of the statements that I found, uh, I would say, intriguing throughout my studies, and one that I hold dear, is that the mission of God gave birth to the church. The church didn't give birth to the mission. Yeah. And so that's so important to realize is because that means that the mission drives the church. The church doesn't drive mission. Right. Very cool. And, and depending on how you look at that, like if you think the church drives the mission, then everything will be church centric. Yeah. Well, that's not the way Jesus set it up. So, uh, so I'm kind of chasing a rabbit there. But so for me in my studies, like I actually go all the way back to Genesis 1. Very cool. As yeah. far as the yeah. mission of God. And here's how I would define God's mission. God God is on mission to create a people for himself to glorify him in all spheres of life. And so we see that in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's going to create a people and he's going to tell them to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. Mm-hmm. And so he's going to put them in this garden. And there's this one scholar uh, that, that really has been influential, G.K. Bill, who talks about how how God wanted Adam and Eve to expand the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. He wanted them to expand the boundaries uh, that many scholars would say that the Garden of Eden was the temple where God was present with man, where God enjoyed man um, and fellowship with him. Man enjoyed fellowship with one another, and they were to expand the temple, to expand the garden till the glory of God filled the earth. And so... um, so that that's kind of where for me I see uh, this this idea of God's mission really begin to take shape. Yeah, that's very cool. I I feel like maybe w- the way you explain that and and the way that like an average person who attends church and and has a even just a, a basic understanding of of uh, Christianity and what it is, it makes a lot of sense. But I I even me <clears throat> excuse me I've been in the church for my whole life. I grew up in the church and, uh, was in, I was thinking about when you said you're doing ministry since you were like 17, I think that's about like when I got into Mm. music in our youth group, you know, or like, or actually it was earlier than that. Mm. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the idea of the mission drives the church, the church doesn't drive the mission. I think that's like, it makes sense when you say that, but I don't never really, you never really start there. Right. You know, I never really have those conversations with like my team members on the worship team or when we're doing, you know, local, you know, missions or, or like reaching our community or even with organic outreach, which is a big thing for Kevin, right. um, who started that. I, I, uh, yeah, it's to have that perspective. Yeah. It's, it's kind of refreshing to hear that actually, like this reminder that like, we're not this thing that's d- designed this mission and we, we have these plans and we have outreach schedules and all this thing, stuff. And right. we, we we're making all these decisions to go out and reach the lost for, for Christ. Uh, but to remind yourself that like, we've been commissioned to do this. It's that the beginning. Yeah. Is well, there. And, and it's one of those things uh, too, Cole, where when people have asked me, 
Um, you know, do, does the church give to missions? You, you know, yeah, or yeah. you know, or the church would set aside a portion to missions, right, right. or you, you know, uh, w- one of the things that I've 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 always told the churches that I lead is that when you give to the local church, you give to the mission of God. Why? Because for me, once again, I'm rooting mission in in what God has been doing since the very uh, moment of creation mm-hmm. that He is He is on mission to create a people for Himself. And and so when it comes to discipleship, and I know that Kevin is writing a, a book yeah, on discipleship yeah, right yeah. now. So the way I look at discipleship, it's the convergence of the mission of God and the image of God. Mm-hmm. All right. So if mankind has been created in the image of God, right, we, we have been created in a way to reflect his glory. Yeah. So we reflect it ontologically, which is a big word, which means basically naturally. It, it It's where our moral intellect, yeah. it's, it's, it's the eternal aspect of, of humanity, like it's in our being, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're supposed to, you know, that's how we reflect God's glory. And then there's these functional aspects of God's glory. And that's where the be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. And so the way we relate with one another, what we create with our with our words, mm-hmm. right? We're, right yeah. now we are creating sentences that are creating a conversation that hopefully is being fruitful, yeah. you know, uh, to the listeners, right? So that is an element of creation. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, real estate, doctors, teachers, stay at home moms. They, they're they all creating something, right? And then how we operate, how we steward. So all of those are functions of the image of God on our life. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they shattered the image. So picture a mirror mm-hmm. and someone takes a hammer to the mirror and shatters it. So what once gave this kind of, you know, uh, a perfect reflection, reflection yeah. Yeah. now is fragmented and distorted. And so you cannot get a, a perfect reflection. Right. Well, that's mankind. So that's the reason why we're broken morally. That's yeah. the reason why we're broken in, you know, intellectually. That's yeah. the reason why we're, you know, kind of broken with our relationships. That's the reason why, like when, uh, when God told Adam, you know, that thorn and thistles now, because you yeah. sin, thorn and thistles will c- cover your work. So mm-hmm. what what should have been just this, this harmonious kind of fruitful labor mm-hmm. now is filled with struggle and toil? Well, that's the reason why, you know, again, it's the fall that creates the thorn and thistles in what we do and how we do it. And then even how we steward and operate, yeah. right, is now damaged because now we don't do so under the lordship of Jesus we actually do it in our, in, in our own way and yeah. how we want to do it. And so so now the image of God has been shattered, but God is on mission now to redeem a people for himself. Mm-hmm. And that's where we see from the moment of Abraham that he's going to call a Gentile, a pagan, mm-hmm. Abraham, who's a polytheistic worshiper. Yeah. And he's like, I'm going to have grace on you, and I'm going to, through you, make a people and that people will be a blessing for all peoples. Mm-hmm. So it's from then on, God is now on mission. This is so cool to redeem a people for himself from all peoples on planet Earth. And so now this idea of God redeeming a people means that he's going to repair the image of God on their life yeah. so that they might reflect him mm-hmm. the way that they were created to do so prior to the fall. So that's what that's why discipleship is not just about programs and ministries yeah. and it's not it's church centric where we're going to try to no it's literally about all spheres of life mm-hmm. and engaging people from every walk of life and every eth- you know from every ethnic background so that they might be invited into yeah. not being God's people. Yeah. Man, I think there's a super glue sermon illustration in there somewhere with that mirror thing. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, yeah. There, there's definitely something in yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. No, I it's it's funny though cuz I, I think um you know for me I have a I have a I've been in ministry and I've been involved in ministry for for a long time now but for actually uh very few mm. different churches and ministries and and uh uh, I will say though that with Shoreline and with Kevin's uh, vision of organic outreach, <clears throat> excuse me, I something stuck in my throat. Mm. Um, uh, there's this this intrinsic uh, this thing that he pushes a lot. That's we we have an outreach department. We we, right. we do, and we have a a, a missions department. A, 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 we call it outreach, uh, yep. um, where they are. Uh, you know, reaching people in our, our, our church, our, our local area, our country, our world. And we, we have that department right. and that we believe that's a part of it, but, but truly Kevin has pushed this idea of, of outreach of, of 
uh, evangelism mm. into every aspect of the church. And right. that's part of that mission. And so it just sounds so, it sounds very like in line with that. And I, mm. I, I really appreciate that perspective because, you know, I don't think what you're saying is we should do away with the, 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 the missions department no. or we shouldn't do away with the, the annual budgeting for the, for right. the department or whatever. But, uh, the idea that like that's the ultimate goal of each uh, different area of ministry within the confines of right. like a local church. Yeah, well, you know, so Ed, uh, my boss, my yeah, friend, yeah, you know, he talks about mission, mm-hmm. missions, and missional. Yeah, and so, so what I've just kind of laid out is really the theology of mission. Yeah, it's this kind of all encompassing what God's trying to do, right? Um, and then you have missions, which is kind of the activity. Right. So that's the reason why we would have something like an outreach, a missions yeah. department, or that's the reason why we would go on missions or, yeah. you know, whether that's local or global is yeah. it's the activity. And then missional is this kind of adjective that describes the posture yeah. of a believer. And so, and I think that's, you know, that's important for churches to realize is that, you know, the church is the vehicle by which God is accomplishing his mission. But then we have missions like projects and, you know, strategies Mm -hmm. and outreaches. Right. Uh, And then we really try to disciple our people to be missional that when they go to Starbucks, when, you know, they go to Target and, you you know, they wherever, you know, in their own life. Like even as as parents that we're trying to be missional, we have this posture that we constantly are aware that God is using us to not only reflect his glory, but to invite people Mm -hmm. into uh, being part of his family. Yeah. So where does that fall in line? I feel like I I think we talked about, gosh, several weeks ago, um, I talked with Kevin uh, and about how there is kind of this reality of of different churches. Maybe it's uh, denominationally charged or non-denominationally charged, but uh, uh, this idea that a lot of churches have kind of that that thing that they do, that they really focus on, whether it's discipleship, whether it's like an evangelical church is really focused on, on sharing the gospel, whether it's, you know, uh, there's all kinds of different realms and realities of that. So what, where's the harm in that? Because I feel like that's not holistic. Is that fair to say? Of, you know, you're talking about like a church just focused on one thing. Yeah. Really, yeah. really focused on, let's say a church is like really focused on discipleship yeah. and they're really focused on, on how do we uh, really grow the people that are in attendance of our church. And right. they're, they're really focused on, on how do we help them feel more connected? And uh, Kevin has used this term of uh, uh, circling the wagons yeah. you know, or like that imagery of that. And, uh, is there harm in that or is that is that something that maybe will naturally pr- produce people who are passionate about the gospel they're passionate about uh um the mission of Christ and then right. they go out uh or does that give people an excuse to like really just focus on their group or yeah. is that do you see that yeah i mean is that common? I, well i mean here's what uh, here's is what is common in at least the church in north america yeah. is that uh 60 to 70% are plateaued or declining yeah you know, so that means that they're not reaching new people. Right. Uh, but what I've definitely seen uh, as I've studied the kind of the, the church's landscape is that we definitely have a tendency to fill ourselves with Bible studies. Mm-hmm. Like, so I grew up in a Southern Baptist kind of tradition, right. um, which they had a sun, you know, it was a Sunday school, mm-hmm. uh, worship. Then on Sunday evening, we had discipleship right. training. Then we had another worship service. And then we, had visitation on right. Tuesday and then we had Wednesday night Bible study and prayer. Yeah. And 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 here's the thing, I'm not knocking on that that um that kind of structure because yeah. I, I was raised under that structure and I would say I turned out pretty well. Now I understand there's a I just lot met that you. I, I can't comment. You, you, you can't yeah. Yeah. yeah so you don't know the yeah. verdict is still out. <laughs> yeah. Um but but what I will say though is that I think what happens many a times is that people definitely get busy. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the Mary and Martha syndrome. Right, right, right. They get busy with the Martha doing, whether it's another Bible study, mm-hmm. another committee meeting, another whatever, you know, yeah. whatever it might be. 
and they they neglect actually their own relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing: when you start neglecting your relationship with Jesus, and it just becomes a bunch of ritualistic things that you do or that you consume. Well, then you actually start not doing what Jesus would do. And right. here's what we know Jesus did. He hung out with lost people. Yeah, yeah. And so this, and, and we know this by research too, the longer a church is in existence, the harder it is for them to reach lost people. Mm-hmm. The longer someone is a believer, the further removed they are from lost people. Yeah. Now, yeah. now this is now this is mind-blowing, right? Because you would think, and I, I mean... You would think that the longer a church is in the community, Mm -hmm. the closer to the community they would be. You would think that, again, I mean, reading Scripture, right, if we're we're wanting to read Scripture and reflect what it says, right, you would think that a follower of Jesus who who communes and fellowships with him for 30, 40, 50 years— would have so many lost, you know, again, so many lost friends be around. But that's just not the reality. Mm-hmm. So, so there has been this disconnect in American Christianity from what a mature disciple is, what they think it is, versus what a mature disciple is in the New Testament. Right. Yeah, man. It's it's uh, it's an interesting thing when you find yourself telling like people like you, maybe you should come to church less. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I actually ran the young adults ministry here for, for uh, a couple years, like two years or so. Um, when I just came off an internship here and, and, uh, what I found was we had a really healthy, like, uh, I would say for this area, we had a really healthy young adult ministry and it was, uh, it was um, a lot of fun. We had a great band. We had the pastors kind of rotating and right. I would do all the scheduling and that kind of thing for like preaching. And, and uh, we did everything we could to maintain that it wasn't um, a substitute for church. Right. Um, and so that, that this was an extra thing. And we, we definitely saw a lot of people come in on Sundays and stuff, but um, so I did that for uh, several years. And then um, when Nate Harney, uh, actually Kevin's youngest son, mm-hmm came in and was, uh, jumped in on a lot of the preaching and, and investing in that ministry too. We, we started like reaching out to other churches and other, other young adult groups and stuff and, and, uh, doing some collaboration stuff and, and it was a lot of fun, but what you quickly learn Hmm. is there's a, there's a grip, there's like 10, 15, 20 of these, these either college students or they were like young professionals, um, who were going to every young adult, anything from like four or five different churches. And like, you quickly realize like, okay, they do Monday night services. And then like, we have our Sunday night services. Were they like shopping for like a, like a mate, you know, shopping for a date? Well, that's probably, yeah. yeah, Thomas, Thomas is shaking his head. (laughs) Yes. So, so. Well, I would say, I would say, I would say yes. I would say yes to some, but to others, I would say that's like all they wanted. Like all they wanted to do is like go to more church services and like, they, they were looking for maybe, maybe I think it was like a loneliness, whether it was right. looking for a mate or looking just for friends right. or, or it was just, they were so passionate about like learning about the, the Bible or, or right. worshiping through song. I know it's a big deal for some yeah. of these people, but we've had some discussions with them and it was like, Hey, like, are you spending any time outside of your house and the church? Like, yeah. cause you need to be investing in people. But, uh, a lot of it came down to them looking for a mate. <laughs> I, I would say Thomas was a part of that too. And I don't know if you have any comments about that, but that was a big struggle for a long time. Any, you know? any healthy uh, young adult ministry is whether you like it or not also a singles ministry. <laughs> it, it sure is. <laughs> that, that's my take. That's, yeah. And it's, it's a, there's a, you know, it's definitely a breeding ground for, uh, interesting people too. Which so. is, I mean, and here's another way of even thinking about, and whether it's young adults or whether it's um, Gen X or baby yeah. boomers, it, again, in the church, it's easy to go to a Bible study. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, easy totally. to sit there and consume, which as Americans, we... Do. We actually consume every day. Yeah. And and consumption is not a bad thing. I'm reading a book right now called Hidden World Views. Mm-hmm. And one of uh one of the chapters in terms of a hidden worldview in 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 American life that can seep into Christianity is consumerism. Yeah. Uh but that doesn't mean consuming is is bad in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. 
but but when when consumption consumes us to yeah. the point that we need all of this in order in order yeah. to feel satisfied i think sometimes what happens is that we feel you, you know our lives with bible study after bible study mm-hmm. you, you know um because it's an easy thing to do uh, and we think that we've done something right. and we feel good about ourselves but what we end up neglecting is a larger vision to what we're called to do as believers and because it's harder to go deep into community right yeah. we m- many of our relationships are just kind of surfacey relationships mm-hmm. hey how are you doing i'm yeah, fine right, oh good right. good, good, good how's good. the kids oh man they're they're great you yeah. know or man you know and i'm sure this is the happening in california as it is in illinois yeah. but our kids like we have um we have three kids Kids, a 14 year old, a 12 year old, and a nine year old. Well, the the ninth grader, they've not been able to play football, and so I might say, you know, he's been a little bummed, you know, about. But but we stay surfacey, yeah. and we don't, yeah. you know, because it's messy if you go beneath the surface, and then you add, you know, you add that kind of sphere of reaching people yeah. far from Jesus. Well, the, you know, and here's the thing: they got some jacked up lives. Yeah. But but we're just as jacked up. But yeah. we, we, you know, we we're really good at covering it up. Right. You know, but it's just messy to reach lost people. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so and that's where I feel like you know this idea of going deeper in discipleship. It's harder. It's sacrificial. Yeah. It costs a little. You know, well, I don't want to say a little. It costs a lot more to go deeper into the gospel. Yeah. I think too with like what you're just saying, a lot of the. The context of those conversations are are not conducive. I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times when I go, hey, Josh, how are you doing? Like the last thing I want you to do is be honest with me. <laughs> <Right>. And <laughs> to like, be, please don't be honest. Yeah, please don't be honest. That's me like, being yeah, yeah, honest yeah. right now. And like where you're like, because we're walking through the the church lobby or we're, or you see somebody at the grocery store or, or um, you know, anything like that. But I, what I'm, what is a reminder for me in when I, I know that I feel that way when I see a person that I, you know, know, or, or am an acquaintance to, or even a friend, like I'm here doing something or have like a purpose to being at the grocery store or to, you know, walking my dog. I'm trying to get the dog calmed down so I can do other things. Uh, I, you know, things like that were, that reminds me that, I personally, and I, I, I hope this can speak to some people, I personally have to put myself in positions where I'm intentionally there to be in like communion and to be right. in conversation with people, whether they're Christians or non-Christians or whether I'm sharing personal stuff about my life or if I'm sharing my faith or right. receiving some from someone else. Like I have to intentionally put people in front of me yeah. because I'm in all honesty, not wanting people to be honest with me when I go, how you doing? Right. Like, you know, well, and the key word there is the, you know, intention yeah. and, and intentionality. And, and I would, you know, I mean, hopefully this can free some people up. Maybe, yeah. maybe even you Cole. Oh, I mean, here, and, and here's the thing that I, you know, that even about what you said is that I'm, we're not asking you to do that with every single person that no, you meet. No. And like, uh, cause I, I'm, I know that this, even the staff here is yeah. fairly large. So you can't yeah. even do that with all the staff. No. But when you look at Jesus's, and you know, again, this is more of a descriptive, you know, element of of Jesus's ministry. So it's not prescriptive, meaning it's not prescribing you do this. Yeah. But just as a descriptive model, if you look at Jesus, you know, so he ministered to the multitudes. He sent out the the seventy or seventy two, depending on what version of the yeah. Bible that you read. Yeah. Uh, he actually did life with twelve, mm-hmm. but even in the twelve, he had three closest friends. Yeah. And, and and so what I'm kind of suggesting when it comes to discipleship is that you're only going to have a handful of people that you kind of at least, you know, have community with, mm-hmm. but you're even going to have even less that you have these deep, intimate relationships yeah. with. And what I'm suggesting is that you, you know, like pick a couple, like, yeah. you know, and pour your life into them, you know, but when, and then like when you're really reaching out and I, and here's the other thing about, re, you know, kind of reaching out to people far from, from Jesus, you, you know, I think there's kind of three spheres that the church should involve herself in mm-hmm. when it comes to reaching people far from Jesus, individually, corporately, 
and institutionally. Mm -hmm. So individually, you're going to know people, you know, maybe it's your neighbors, right? And I I would hope not your coworkers. Uh, So... Uh, but we'll we're see. praying for Thomas, I hear. Yeah, that, and I are. just heard that while we, we were, you know, coming in today. <laughs> I think that was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. <laughs> yeah. was, it was something about, the hat, you know, you were talking about his hats, yeah. you know, that, you know, does he wear like funky hats all the time Dude. or just the, you know, the beanie? It's cold right now okay. and it's hot in the summer. He's still got that beanie on. Uh, even right. in the summertime. That's right. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I, I did work, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my good friend back in Louisville, who was the worship pastor. You just said it, it correctly, by the way. Be, what? That's Louisville. Louisville. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is the way. Yeah. Yeah, that, it, so just for the listeners out yeah. there, it is not Louisville. Yeah. So because you might be watching like, you know, a national news network yeah, and yeah. they might, you know, because, you know, Louisville has been on the news, you know, over the last few months on various levels. <laughs> but yeah, they would say it wrong. And you know that they have not yeah. listened. And, you know, to someone who's native of Louisville. Just wrong. Like, you know, it, yeah. it, it sounds like a mouthful. But yeah. It's not Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> it's Louisville. But, uh, but yeah, I had a friend. Yeah. I mean, he wore beanies all the time. And it could be 90 degrees outside. And I'm like, bro, man, like, you're frying your brain. You're like, let your, brain. Let, let your head, like, breathe. So, <laughs> so, you know. so, so you know. life. It is. It is a commitment. It is a That's commitment. Right. right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, especially in Chicago now, uh, as I'm walking the dog, I have to wear my own beanies, but it hurts my ears after about an hour. Like, does your ears get used to it, Thomas, after a while? Oh, yeah. They've been, oh. you know, they, they, they've been molded. Yeah, yeah. They've been molded. Over time. Over yeah. time. Yeah, and that yeah, beanie absolutely. has, too. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you really got to wear that's it. That's fair. <laughs> Uh, that's all. That's good. That's yeah. good. You're, the beanie's been yeah, molded. So yeah. I don't even know where we were, I, but I know. you know. Um, but the beanie crisis is pretty serious it is, these yeah, days. Yeah. You know. No, but I, solve it. I think I think talking about you know just your the discipleship in in the church and like being poured into. Uh, to me, I I just even back to the young adult conversation. Yeah. That was that was a conversation that actually Nate Harney and I had with this this young guy. Uh, years ago, young guy, I'm 29, give me a break. Um, but, uh, and it was years ago, uh, uh, we had this conversation and Nate was always so good at, at, at really, um, uh, having a, you know, an intentional, like he's bringing something up intentionally, but right. making it feel like, like, Hey, I'm just having a conversation with you. And, and we talked to this guy and just really asked him like, you know, where, so I, I was just, I was thinking about it and I, I guess preached at, at, Monterey church mm. on Monday and I saw you there. That's so cool. I didn't know you were part of that, that community. Yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah. And I was talking to Cole and he, he like led something over with Calvary and, and he was saying that he, you're over there and that's so cool, man. Like right. you're really investing. So he's like, so what do you, what do you do for fun? Like, what do you do? You know? And it was just like, it led to this conversation of like, like what this person was doing right every day yeah. was investing in, in like, only like being at the church yeah. and, and this idea of, of constantly being poured into and having no avenue to pour out and to reach other people and to, uh, be light of the world. Right. And, and that's, that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to prevent myself from doing that. Um, uh, I have a lot of hobbies and things I do, yeah. but I, so it's not that hard, but, uh, and I'm a relatively social person, but, um, <laughs> Which is why you got stuck doing the podcast. Honestly, you're social. You love podcasts. <laughs> yeah. You're the master of it's, gab. It, well, I hope not. Oh, no. <laughs> Am I that person? Oh, no. That's never been my intention. Uh, but uh, that's a, that's a good, but that's, that's a good trait. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and so, and I think, I think some people who don't have that, I think yeah. even those, those one-on-one conversations with, you know, their neighbor are very, yeah. are very difficult. And I think that's where it would even come down to, you really have to discipline yourself. Yeah. Like, no, you know, definitely. so for, you know, for you, conversations come natural. Right. And so, uh, so it's kind of easy. You, you just have to be a little bit more intentional for some people. It really is a discipline. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I definitely. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can I can talk with anybody about anything, and uh, maybe it's a maybe it's a blessing, maybe it's obnoxious. But <laughs> uh, uh, but I also like I definitely. There's times you know, I just moved and immediately connected with our neighbors, and okay. I I love we have such a cool mm. relationship with our our neighbors, and it's 
it truly is a blessing. But there's also times like when it's like, I forgot to take the trash out and it's like five o'clock in the morning and I'm running out there in my pajamas and I'm like, they forgot to, I'm not really looking for a conversation right there. And like, I'm doing everything to like avoid that experience. And I I do that too. Uh, But I will say with the discipline thing, I mean, it's discipline for me to eat healthy and I do it because it's, I need to, you know, it's right. discipline to, to exercise. It's it, there's discipline to, to studying the word of God. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't mean it's, it's hard or, or easy for any individual, but like, I think discipline is a good thing in our lives. And man, I, 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 it's hard to remember that for a lot of people, you know, that's something that you really do need to, right. as, as a Christian, I think not even just as a Christian, I think that human interaction is a good thing period. But yeah. as a Christian, when it pertains to this, uh, this topic, man, it's so important for, for people who say like, you know, I struggle with that. I'm not super interested in that. I, I know there's different levels of, of health for, for an individual when they're saying I'm a really introverted person or whatever it is. But, uh, you know, I do need to, you know, take a step. I need to interact with people. I need to, to, you know, show the love of Christ in my neighborhood, in my school, in my place of work. Right. Uh, and, and that's a, yeah, that's an interesting, uh, thing to think about. I think, you know, I, do people use that as an excuse a lot? Their, their introversion or like, Oh, I, well, I mean, here's the thing. People excuse, I shouldn't well, say, yeah, but. <laughs> well, I mean, people always have excuses, uh, uh, for things that they either are scared to do or don't want to yeah. do. Right. Um, like, you know, and that could be exercising. Yeah. Like maybe, you know, I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, a lot of people, you, 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 they don't exercise, but they, right. but they know that they need to exercise. Right. So, so what are the excuses? Oh, I'm too busy yeah. or, you know, work a lot. I mean, here's the thing you, you can, but, and, and I, and this is one of the things I love about Kevin in his book, you, you know, no is a beautiful word. Yeah. When you say no to one thing. You know, hopefully you're opening the door to say yes. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, um, and so, so yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. I mean, excuses actually rain when you don't want to do something yeah. or you're scared about doing something. Yeah. And so, yeah, so excuses are definitely part of the arsenal of American Christianity. Yeah, definitely. On, you, you know, I don't want to go to church. Well, well you know, well, why? Or, you know, oh, man, I just wish I, you know, man, I wish I could just be at church more. Well, yeah. why can't you? Well, well the uh, kids, yeah, and just, yeah, you know, yeah. we got all, you know, and so, I mean, and I get it. There, there's some, you know, there's some things that will just come in the way. But at the end of the day, it, you do what you want to do. Yeah. You do what you want to do. Yeah. We we live in that country. We sure do. Um, hey, I wanted to uh, bring up, we so we are recording this before you're preaching on Sunday, but yeah. this is coming out after you preach on Sunday. Right. So uh, I don't want you to repeat yourself in any way, but just your sermon uh, that's coming up that yep. will be, have had happened already when people listen to this. <laughs> right, right. Uh, can you give me like a, just a basic, uh, just like a, your, your description of, of what you're going to be talking about? Yeah. So we're in this, you know, kind of in this Advent, you know, kind of season and we're in this series at Shoreline called yeah. Adore. Yeah. And so uh, last week, uh, Kevin talked about uh, John 1 mm-hmm. uh, and the word became flesh. Yeah. And so I will be talking about how Jesus is the Messiah or I will have talked about Jesus. You will Jesus. have talked about Yeah, I will yeah. have talked. Yeah. So I'm talking in the past. This tense. is an interesting conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of time travel um, right now. And, you know, Messiah, you, you know, M- M- Messiah is a, a kind of an a interesting word because it just basically means anointed one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Christ is kind of, uh, this, the, the Greek version of Messiah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Christ, he's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. Um, now in the old Testament, they would either, uh, you know, kind of anoint a King, mm-hmm. a priest or a prophet. Those kind of were the three offices that anointing, uh, you know, or kind of the word anointed was used. Right. Well, so interestingly, Jesus is all of the above. He is prophet, priest, and king. But we will have, uh, you know, but we focused on this idea that Jesus is the king who has come, Mm -hmm. right? And so kind of the the main point that I fleshed out 
was uh, that the coming of the king should make our hearts want to sing. So, you know, and I, I know that I didn't get to, you know, I talked a little bit about it in the introduction, uh, but this idea of singing is mm-hmm. is really important, I think. Amen. And I, I mean, well, yeah. you would like that, right, Cole? Like, so if you, so I just would say, um, yeah, if you don't sing, Cole's going to make you start singing. Amen. Yeah. So yeah. let me ask, because I'd love to, you know, having, you know, having this kind of opportunity. Yeah. All right. So you're a worship um, leader. Yeah. And so, uh, you, you know, now worship is more than singing. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. But talk to, I mean, I'm going to interview you, you now. Oh, so lay it on me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But I mean, talk, talk to me about singing. Like yeah. what, what is the, you know, okay. What is the kind of the inner workings of songs? Yeah. So I would say um, the, I think there's a interesting thing about, about uh, music and melody and rhythm. And uh, I think there's a really powerful opportunity for community in that because when, uh, when there's rhythm, and this is a very simplistic understanding yeah. of it, but like when there's rhythm and there's time, it's, it's more possible. It's made more possible for people to be in, in sync with each other right. and in unison. And that's down to being able to like clap on the same beat, right. you know, and we can both do that, you know? Uh, so you're telling me that, an element of the fall and a manifestation is the fact that I cannot sing and clap at the same time. You can't. Well, I mean, I've, 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 you know, I have to, I have to like tap my foot, yeah, yeah, you know, so I yeah. know kind of the beat. Like I took piano for nine years, so I understand four okay. four time, yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Where where the beat, yeah. you know, that's about it. Though. Yeah, but well, th- th- that is very interesting it, though for those of who cannot, yeah, yeah. you know, do that. It's no, probably I think because of the I, fall. I th- that's amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which one, Adam or Eve? Do you think was what, so, rhythmless? Uh, well, he, <laughs> I, I think it was probably Adam. I, you know, I always tell Adam, I always say that Adam fell first because he was the bonehead who allowed the serpent to get in. Amen. Because he was supposed to be the priest. Yeah. He was supposed to guard the garden. Yeah. You know, and not let anything unclean come in. Because we see that in Genesis 2.15. Yeah. He was the garden to keep it, which were priestly terms. Anyways, but that's here. He that we're talking about yeah. singing. Singing. So, yeah. so uh, I, I just think that's a unique thing about, about song, about melody, about rhythm, is that uh, I think it has a unique um, ability to to be like communal mm. and like everything from you singing along in the car to uh, the way that it triggers memory. Right. I think that's a unique thing about about uh, music. I think a lot of people get their theology from the songs that we sing yeah. because they can remember them. And that's the, the same reason why we put a melody and a rhythm to our ABCs. Right. It, and there's there's something to that. And I think um, when we're doing that uh, together in a, in, a, in a community and we're doing that together in a, what we would call a congregation, um, there's a powerful thing when you're, you're, Number one, you're you're using words uh, to describe or to uh, the attributes of God or to give praise or adoration to right. to the Creator, um, and you're doing it with other people in rhythm. And it's right. got and there's also there's a ton of studies about about uh, the way that music and rhythm with without lyrics, um, with percussion, without percussion, all, all this kind of stuff where how it triggers your brain and like how neurons are firing and the way that it, it it affects your mind in a really, really powerful way when they've done all these really fascinating studies. Mm. Um, uh, But yeah, I I think there's a unique thing when you apply that. And I don't think that's unique to, uh, or I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's without design, right? you know, the way that it, it truly affects our, our brains, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, so, you know, one of the things that I said uh, yesterday mm-hmm. was that that singing is an act of worship. The You know, the Psalms tell us to to sing to the Lord a new song, mm-hmm. um, you know, so so there is this element where where singing is is um, a, an act of worship. Mm-hmm. But what you're saying is is so true is the reason why, you know, like I always go back to the first song that I, I see in Scripture, and it's in Genesis 2, after God uh, brings Eve to Adam, you know, he belts out into a song, you know, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called a whoa man. Like, <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, like that—that that is a poem. That is a first yeah. song. And so, it, it you know, so it's this impulse 
impulse that we have when something, you know, triggers our heart, something resonates or a longing that we have in our heart, it, it you know, our impulse is to sing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and that's where I think when, when mankind fell, in the garden, and were and and, and they were kicked out. Mm-hmm. Now this is you know I, I preached uh, on this at uh, the church where I currently serve as a teaching pastor. I, I preached on this um, uh, two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You know where when Adam and Eve when they were kicked out of the garden, uh, mankind was never to live outside of the garden. Like yeah. that, they were not designed, like that's not what God designed them for. Mm-hmm. They designed, you know, God had designed them to live with him in the garden, to have perfect harmony and fellowship and flourishing in the garden and to extend the boundaries. Mm-hmm. So when they were kicked out, they were strangers and aliens now in this foreign territory. Mm-hmm. And so they're longing for home. See, mankind is longing for home. Humanity is longing for home. And yeah. I think that's the reason why many of the songs that, you know, whether they're Christian songs, whether they're secular songs, mm-hmm. which I don't necessarily liked kind of the bifurcation, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do think that a secular song can be very sacred, yeah, totally. you know, to people. But but here's what I would also say. The secular singer, you, you know, who doesn't know Jesus singing a song, it's spiritual to them, yeah. you, you know, in whatever, you know, in kind of whatever the lyrics that they're, they're really trying to communicate. Yeah. And the songs that really are meaningful to us. You know, again, depending, you know, regardless of who sings it yeah. or what genre it is, yeah. they're, they're songs that resonate with the deep longings of our heart. Absolutely. Whether it's about, you know, the the the, the, the fact that we loathe, you, you know, how dark this world is mm-hmm. or the fact of how we celebrate, lo- whatever it may be. Right. It, again, singing reflects. And so that's why I really wanted to bring out that the coming of the king should make our hearts want to sing. Yeah. That every single person on planet Earth, when they hear about the the, the Messiah, King Jesus, who has who has come, their hearts like they they should want to sing when they hear about the coming of the King. Yeah, that's powerful, man. I yeah, and I I know you know a lot of people. That's that including myself. It's a really um, important and very. Uh, um, tangible almost feeling of uh, a way to worship mm. uh is through song and I, I i definitely you know i mean that's the whole the idea of like music is not and like singing is not the only form of worship is right. basically my dead horse that i always yeah. beat with my team and uh uh yeah so i i'm i'm no stranger to that and i i believe that firmly but there truly is i, I know that it's probably a uniquely powerful way for me um that uh my my sense of connection and uh when i really see myself um focused on on the creator is when i'm doing that through yeah. song and it's a powerful thing but um yeah hey you gotta uh, for those that are watching um maybe for those who aren't watching you can't see this but you, you've had a book here and yeah. it's it's interesting to me it's what is it called a uh, joy for the world yeah what what's uh what's striking you out of this well, so what you just said, um, Greg Forrester is the author of of this book, Joy for the World, and the the kind of subtitle is How Christianity Lost Its Cultural Influence and Can Begin to Rebuild It. Yeah. And so, you, you know, and this is, and what you just said, Cole, is um, is v- basically what he says in his introduction. Uh, he says, if, if we preach the gospel, but don't live in a way that reflects it, our neighbors won't believe it. And I think, I think what has happened in American, you know, kind of Christianity is that we love singing Christian songs. Mm-hmm. We love singing Christmas carols. Like, um, you, you know, I, as I said yesterday, I, we started playing Christmas music after Halloween because of, it's just yeah. been 2020. Yeah. Yeah. You just do everything different in 2020, yeah. you right? Do. So, you do. Uh, but, but for for Christianity in America, we sing the songs, but the songs that we sing really aren't reflective in our lives. Mm-hmm. And so, what you know, Greg really talks about is that you know this this idea of joy to the world, which again, as I you know pointed out yesterday, is that it wasn't even meant to be a Christmas song. Mm-hmm. Isaac Watts didn't write it to be a Christmas song. Yeah. It later was put to music, his poem. It was later put to music, and then it became this famous Christ, you know right. Christmas song. But the truth in there, you know, this is where he lays out the truth in in kind of five you know kind of five you know kind of uh, tr- uh, kind of truths. Let every heart 
heart prepare him room? Like, yeah. do we live in a way where we, you know, we, we sing, let every, yeah, don't make me sing. Oh, I'll no, let you, you sing just did that. it. I yeah, didn't ask so you to, and you I just know, did it. I know, I know. I'm embarrassed now. I hope Thomas can edit that because I am not a singer. Did you get auto tune yet? So, <laughs> no. Yeah, not, not quite. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, you, you know, let every heart prepare him room. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, so one, have we even, pre- you, you know, especially, I mean, this is the Christmas season. Have we, as Christians, we sing this song, have we allowed Jesus to take up a residence in our heart or have yeah. we just let him take up a room in our heart? Right. Like that's, that's huge. Yeah. Because that, that, that has implications, right? If, if you don't, if you don't, if you just let Jesus have a room, well, then you, you, then he becomes a drawer of yeah. your life. He wants, he wants to take up a residence, yeah. which means he's going to change your house. Right. So, so that, so that, that's, that's an example of mm-hmm. we sing it, but do we live it? Then he says, let men, their songs in, in, employ. Um, and, and Greg, he writes this, because God made human beings as social creatures. This joy of God is not locked up in an isolated heart. It flows among us and transforms how we relate to one another. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, do again, this is this idea of, are we employing, you know, employing this idea that this song is, as you just said, yeah. In community, um, then he says, "Let Earth receive her King." Mm. Now, this is you know again, this is hard living in a democracy, yeah, uh, because we don't you know in some sense in a democracy, guess who's the king? The people. We have the power yeah. now. I you know now again, I, I don't know where I'm not trying to get, get into the whole political yeah. statement. Or, <laughs> are you Republican or are you Democrat? <laughs> it's, it's for it, but regardless of whether you, you know you're a Republican, Democrat, conservative, or, or liberal, this idea of understanding the kingship, the lordship of Jesus in our life, even over our life as Americans, is very hard. Yeah, you know. So what it de- what it definitely refers to though is in a in a kingdom. Mm-hmm. Everything revolves around the king. Yeah. What he says, what he commands, how he wants you to live, you know, everything revolves around the king. Well, that's the same way our life is. Yeah. So have we have we received him? So we sing it. Do we live it? Then he says he comes to make his blessings flow. Everyone um, can get on board with that. Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, because here's a you know he's come to make his but yeah. Well, here, here we can we can we can flow with that. Yeah. When as long as the blessings flow to us. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like yeah, bring on the. Well, blessings. I'm singing it. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you know. So we we have no problem if God wants to bless yeah. us. But going back to Abraham, right? I'm going to bless you, Abraham. Yeah. But through you. I'll bless all families of the earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, hang on. Yeah, I mean, that's where we stop as Americans is that, yes, as long as the blessings are flowing to us, you know, and then as long as the blessings are flowing to us, sure, we'll we'll be, you know, we'll be givers. We'll be generous. But I think many times we give our leftovers mm-hmm. and we, you, you know, we don't give. So here's the thing about giving, you know, when it comes to really blessing others. Here's a question I always like to ask believers, you know, because the, 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 it comes up in the conversation of tithes. Do we give 10 percent? I mean, here's the thing. The Old, the Old Testament taught 10 percent. Yeah. And people want to know what, what does the New Testament teach? Well, I think 10 percent is a good start. But if you really want to get down into the depths of the gospel in terms of giving, uh, we follow, as Paul would say in Romans, and you guys walk through the book yeah. of Romans, the law of Christ. Mm-hmm. Well, how did Jesus give? Sacrificially. Yeah. So if you're not giving in a way that's sacrificial, then you're probably not giving you know, in the realm of what Jesus would give. Mm-hmm. It's a hard thing, I think, for a lot of people to um, uh, admit to. That yeah. you know, this is the the blessings flow. Yeah, like as long as it's coming to me. But the the idea of in every aspect of the gospel, and like even the way that uh, it, when it comes to like evangelistic, you know, reality is like we're we're partnering with God. Yeah, like you know, we're we're the we understand that the Holy Spirit is what changes hearts, uh, what changes minds, and what leads people to Christ. But it's our job to partner with with God and partner with the Holy Spirit and to to invest in people and to love on people in the same way of, uh, you know, 
making his blessings flow. Right. You know, I think that's a partnership with that, with that we need to step into. Yeah. You know? I lo- I lo- yeah. Yeah. I love that word partnership, stepping yeah. into kind of partnership with yeah. the spirit. Uh, the last thing he says, he rules the world with truth and grace. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this is the tough, I mean, obviously Jesus struck the balance because he was God. You know, and, you know, uh, uh, John chapter one, you know, talks about this idea of truth and grace. And so we want to be people of truth, but at the same time, we want to be people that yeah. are gracious and really holding those intentions. And so what what Greg makes, you know, the argument with those five kind of pillars yeah. is that could you imagine what Christianity could do mm-hmm. if, you know, we sing this song like joy to the world. Mm-hmm. But we take the truths of joy to the world. What would happen if a local church, if the church would live out such truths yeah. in their daily life? You know, then you start beginning to regain some of that mm-hmm. influence that the church has. I mean, let's just be honest, it is lost. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh that's really powerful. I I uh you see that and I think people are not uh, quick to be honest about that, or even like, um, not even quick to be honest, but I feel like the, the loss of that is something that people may like see and notice, but right. like maybe not step into. So, um, Hey Josh, this has been a ton of fun. I, I, I'm super glad I got to meet you today. And, yeah. and, uh, uh, again, this, this whole time warp of like we're recording and then you're preaching and then we're talking about your sermon and stuff, but, uh, I'm super excited for this Sunday and, uh, I'm excited to, to worship with you and yeah. to, to lead people into that. And man, yeah, it's been, this has been a ton of fun. And I, I love, uh, I love this topic. I love this, um, overarching and missiology is an interesting mm-hmm. thing. I, ne- I never, yes. you know how it's, it's a cool concept. So, uh, I, I, uh, really grateful for you to be here and be willing to do this and being willing to preach on Sunday and and to invest in Shoreline. It's uh, it's it's a blessing. Absolutely. Thank well, you. Well, it's definitely a joy and honor to be here. Yeah. And definitely enjoyed our conversation. Look yeah, forward yeah. to Sunday. Yeah. So we'll, we'll pray and we'll see you as this airs on Monday. We'll pray to see how the weather, you know, will cooperate. Yeah, that's... Because I've been looking, like I you know, was telling you, you, know, you and Thomas earlier, I was looking at the weather, you know, for three weeks and I'm like, all right, good, good. And then like on Monday, it started to shift and I'm like... Oh gosh! Somebody should have told you. Yeah, you gotta you gotta wait till like the day before. <laughs> There's still a chance. There's still a chance. There, so we'll pray, yeah. Lord. You know. Yeah. You know. Pull the reins just for a couple hours. Just for a couple hours. Yeah, yeah. just a couple hours. All right. Cool. Hey, good to talk to you. Super good to meet you. I'm, I'm excited for Sunday, and thank you for investing in our church in this way. All right. Thanks, Cole. Whether you're watching this podcast on the YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week with another one.